panelists that we have today, I'm going to go uh, from my right to left, and I'm going to read the, uh, the write-ups that are in the program. Uh, Tony DeLorenzo is here on the end. Uh, Tony DeLorenzo partnered with Jerry Thompson to race the Owen Corning fiberglass Corvettes in the late 60s and early 70s. The two were the most successful duo in FIA and SCCA A production racing, winning 22 straight races from 1969 to 1971. Oof. De Lorenzo attended an SCCA driver's school in Watkins Glen, New York in 1964 and began racing an A sedan Corvette. His dad, who was a General Motors vice president of public relations, purchased a 64 Corvette coupe and let De Lorenzo and his brother spec out the car. Their order caught the attention of GM engineer Zora Arcus Duntal, nicknamed the father of the Corvette, who called them to make sure they were able to handle their car. <laughs> Tom was the engine development test engineer at Chevrolet's Engineering Center in Warren, Michigan in 1960 and raced the 56 Corvette. During the 50, 65 to 66 season, De Lorenzo and Thompson became friends and competitors and in 68, they earned their first direct sponsorship, making the pair instrumental in putting Corvette racing on the map. So, wow. with Tony, we've got a, a great background and some great stories we're going to hear of uh, the Owens Corning team. <laughs> Next to me here is George Winterstein, who uh, many of you may have seen here already uh, at other times when he's come to uh, drive the, uh, the Grand Sport Corvette that we have here. Winterstein's road racing career lasted only a decade, but he squeezed out two decades worth of success in SCCA and FIA competition. He ran in Pennsylvania hill climbs early on, and by 1962, he traded his Porsche 1600 for an ex Pedro Rodriguez Porsche RSK that he bought from Bob Holbrook. That earned him the 63 SCCA E Modified Championship for the Northeast Division. He then bought an Elba Porsche, but first shared Ed Lauther's 427 Cobra at the 12 hours of Sebring to an unremarkable result. The Elba was quickly replaced with Roger Penske's Cooper Chevrolet for the West Coast Series. A good run at Riverside until the engine broke encouraged Winterstein to buy Penske's Corvette Grand Sport Coupe, which he drove in the famed Nassau Speed events. The SCCA noted the quality of Winterstein's presence and his driving ability by awarding him their covered in Kimberly Cup for the year. He started 1965 with a 14th place finish in the Sebring Deluge race with the Corvette, and after some USRC races, he raced in England in the McLaren M1A. In 66, he became the driver for Penske's first race as a non-driving entrant. At Chevrolet uh, Corvette at both Daytona and Sebring, the latter to a ninth place finish in winning the GT class. He then bought the Corvette chassis 002, the white and blue one there, which is on display here, and raced it in selected USRRC events. By the way, the, the, the Corvette that, uh, uh, that George raced is the uh, number nine uh, Penske Chevrolet Corvette there that uh, uh, Kevin McKay uh, has brought down. And thank you, Kevin, by the way, for that. Um, uh, he also won SCCA's Formula B National Champion in the Northeast Division, uh, raced the Gurney Eagle in the Formula 5000 yeah. Series, uh, was an actor and driver in uh, James Garner, the racing scene movie with uh, a spectacular uh, opening uh, display uh, of crashing his Lola. Uh, and then uh, paired with Dickie Smothers in the uh, 1970 Formula 5000 season in a pair of uh, Lotus 70s. So uh, thank you, uh, George, for joining us. Lowell Paddock is here to my other side. He began his automotive career at Automobile Quarterly, becoming editor-in-chief before forming his own publishing company. After attending Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management, he joined General Motors in marketing and later assumed a number of executive assignments in product planning and program management in Germany, China, and Singapore, and served as the managing director of GM India. Since he retired in, 19, in 2017, He's worked with a number of concours and is contributor to uh, Sports Car Market and is editor-in-chief of Wayne Carney's The Chase. He's written extensively about Corvette history and is co-author with Dave Friedman of a photographic history of the Grand Sport Corvettes. 
Uh, on the end here is a Philadelphia native, Ed Wellborn. Uh, Ed was a graduate of Howard University College of Fine Arts and has been referred to as the man who brought beauty back to GM. He was just the sixth head of design for General Motors and the first to lead the division on a global level. During Wellborn's career, he oversaw designs of the Corvette, Cadillac, Escalade, and, the, and revived the Camaro, as well as numerous other designs sold in markets around the world. He's the first automotive designer in history to have his archives placed in the Smithsonian Institute, wow. and he holds the distinction of having been the highest ranked African American in the global automotive industry. He was inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame in 2017. Today, his design creativity has led him to the fashion world, as well as chief design advisor for Bolt Micro Mobility. And he's founder and CEO of Wellburn Meter Production and has a major feature film under development. Oh, jeez. Now, <laughs> <laughs> lastly, not on the stage, but will be joining us via a taint, uh interview that uh, I did uh, with Doug Fian uh, earlier this week. And Doug was the former General Motors program manager of the Global Corvette GT program and is currently Corvette Racing Brand Ambassador. Doug led the Corvette brand to 117 wins, 109 L ALMS series victories, and eight at Le Mans. 13 manufacturers championships, 13 drivers championships, and 14 team championships. They had 65 races where the Corvette racing team came in first and second. So uh, we'll, we'll have that at the very end of the, uh, of the program. So to start off uh, the discussion, uh, I want to turn to uh, uh, Ed Wellborn. And uh, Ed, you know, tell us how uh, the Corvette came to be. Uh, you know, what was uh, what was the history of how that uh, was developed? Yeah, first off, uh, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to be here on the stage with these these great people. Their bios are incredible. I grew up in the Philadelphia area. We're getting a little feedback, I think, uh, in Berwyn, out on the main line. And as a child, you know, it's just a great you know, environment to live in. If you can imagine, age five, maybe six, on a fall afternoon, I'm walking with my mother down this tree-lined road. One of those roads where the trees kind of form a canopy, almost like a tunnel, and it being the fall of the year, there were leaves yellow and brown and red, and, you know, and many of them had fallen to the ground, and as we're walking, I'm kicking these leaves up, and I notice about 70 yards ahead of us, coming out of a side road. Now remember, I'm six years old. And coming out of this side road is a car that I had never seen before. It was small, it had a profile that was very distinctive. And it turned in our direction and was coming our way, kicking up leaves very much in the way I had been doing. And as it passed, now mind you, I'm six, so the headlamp, I was like eye level with the headlamp, and the car had this wire mesh over the headlamp. And as it passed, it was metallic blue, and it had this rumble to the exhaust. And then I saw this small round tail lamp with two little fins coming off of it. And then the car was gone. It was the very first Corvette I ever saw and I will never, ever forget that moment, like it was yesterday. I've been a fan of Corvettes all my life, and the history is tremendous. The history really begins, you know, there's a photo over there at Watkins Glen, where the sports cars are racing. You see that photo that's over there? In the middle of that photo is a GM concept car, the LeSabre. Harley mm -hmm. Earl had that car there as the pace car for those races. That very same day that that photo was taken, Harley Earl got his inspiration to develop an American sports car, right when that photo was taken. Hmm. And they developed the concept vehicle for the uh, Waldorf Astoria for the Motorama Auto Show. And that was 1952. And their idea was, if this car 
is well received. We want to put it in production. We'll build it in St. Louis. The concept car was built in fiberglass, but production would be in sheet metal. Well, the thing was so wildly accepted at the Motorama Auto Show that they rushed it into production, which meant building it in fiberglass at a small plant in Flint, Michigan, where they built 319 of them, mm. hand-built Corvettes, and then they moved production to St. Louis, and by then, the fiberglass uh, production process had really gotten quite good, so they stayed with fiberglass. And that's really at the heart of the beginning of Corvette. I think it's a good point to turn it over to maybe you know. Well, I'm getting feedback too. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the only thing I was going to say is the originally they, they had a six cylinder engine, right? Yeah. But once they put in the small, uh, small block V8, was when the racing really kind of started uh, on the uh, Corvette. So I think going back to, um, whoops. Going back to those very early days, you know, um, someone wrote to us and said, remember to say that Zora Duntov didn't come up with a Corvette, which is true, but the way the Corvette is today is very much a result of Duntov's work. And I think uh, what fascinates about car companies is people. At the end of the day, it's all about how people come together to make things happen. So in those early days, you had this sort of dream team forming of people, one of them being, of course, Zora. The other being Ed Cole, who had put the 49 Cadillac high compression engine together, was an extraordinarily talented engineer, um, and uh, was working then on the small block Chevy, which as we know, has really been a revolutionary engine. Um, and then you had uh, Harley to a certain extent, but also Bill Mitchell rising up in the ranks and not far away from taking over from Harley Earl. So these three people, I'm sure, who were all probably relatively difficult to get along with um, on an individual basis, were really, to paraphrase Lincoln, a team of rivals that understood the tremendous benefit of uh, the Corvette as a brand tool for Chevrolet. And once the V8 was in the car, all of a sudden the car was transformed into something very different. And um, I have a memo here, actually, that Zora did not long after starting work in 1953, where he basically tells his boss, Maurice Ali, who's the head of development at Chevy, um, that, you know, we're getting our ass kicked by Ford, so we've got to do something about it. So, of course, not long after that, um, racing kicks off, and there are a number of different efforts, um, starting with the V8 privateers as well as Chevrolet. Um, then we get into the SR2, which you can see right here, which is kind of based on a streetcar, but heavily modified. And then we get into a very, very different type of vehicle called uh, the SS, which was a wireframe car, very, very sophisticated, but also very problematic. Um, and at that point, Chevrolet was still very much um, in strong support of racing. There was no, there was no ban on racing. Uh, but not too long after that, and part because of the terrible crash uh, that Mercedes had at Le Mans, the American manufacturers started to get very, very anxious about uh, the public endorsement of racing. Um, and that caused a lot of the efforts to go underground, unfortunately, and probably curtailed what the Corvette could have been as a global racer, but it certainly didn't stop um, activities from going on in the racing arena. And probably the most interesting part of that is the Stingray, which was the successor of the SS, was in part funded by Bill Mitchell on, on his own. Hmm. Um, you know, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't um, compete at the same level but um, he, he was able to take the SS, sorry, excuse me, the Stingray on out to circuits, um, make it relatively competitive, but not completely competitive, but it showed that Chevrolet had tremendous uh, capability in terms of, of uh, engineering capability and performance capability. And that, of course, leads us up to, uh, to the Grand Sport, which also was made under the same type of restrictions where the manufacturers could not directly endorse racing, so a lot of that had to be done under the table. And of course, when the Grand Sports show up at Nassau with a bunch of Chevrolet engineers that were on vacation in Nassau, and all of a sudden Ford uh, and the Cobras now have serious competition. The Grand Sports have demonstrated that they can do uh, tremendous performance with all of this um, bespoke and custom work, and you can see it in George's car, but this bears no relation to a traditional Corvette. This is really a custom-built race car, and um, it is uh, at that point that 
Um, the word gets out that Chevrolet is essentially racing without telling anybody, and the word comes down to um, to stop formal racing, stop the formal activities. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to you because I think George can tell the story much better than I can. <laughs>